first verses. The word of God is alive and active, and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and of the spirit, of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. All of Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. We're going to be talking about something a little touchy. Okay, but especially you know, with what we just talked about, I think it's really relevant to speak about it, to talk about it in churches, and to, and to you know, educate people who may not be educated. If you are a believer in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if you're a believer in the Bible, as we'll speak about in just a second, you are not following the company line. You are outside the norm. And it's still tolerated to an extent, but it will not be tolerated in the future. We need to be aware of what that's taking place. Okay, so, so first off, we have to understand that Satan, our, our collective enemy, right, has a plan to overwhelm society in general, and specifically the, cur the church culture of sin. And then when people don't capitulate, and they don't agree with that sin, they don't agree with the tolerance of that sin, and he silences those people. That's his plan. If you are intent that you remain you know, within the truth and, and, and believing the truth, you will expect to have someone try to silence you in the future. And if Christians do speak out against it, they're going to be late. Okay? You may have already heard these terms. Christian intolerance. Religious bias or belief persistence. Okay, these are labels that are already out there. If you haven't heard any of these labels yet, belief persistence means you're stuck. You're stuck in your beliefs. Okay, you're not willing to bend. You're not willing to give up on those antiquated things that come from the Word of God. Okay, you're, you're, you have belief persistence. Praise God. You should be patting yourself on the back. That's an okay thing. But if you haven't heard those things, you've heard those terms, and you attempt to be, to, to remain in the truth, and to remain a believer of what the Bible tells us, you will hear, you will hear, you will hear more and more being kicked around. Um, and those people that say is successful in using to accomplish his strategy, they're going to twist the truth. I, I mean, even by misusing scripture, that's one of Satan's favorite things. He did it to Jesus. He did it to Jesus when Jesus was being tested in the, in the wilderness. It's one of his very favorite things to do. And he does that to try to silence those who aren't prepared to counter back with scripture. How did Jesus fight Satan? He didn't, he didn't duke it out with it. He just told him. He threw the truth back at the twist. And that's exactly what we need to learn about. What I'm going to talk about today is a counter to tolerance. Okay, and we all need to be aware of the counter. So that's what we're going to talk about. So first, let's define tolerance. What is tolerance? According to our buddy Marion, it is the ability or willingness to tolerate something, in particular, the existence of opinions or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. We gotta tolerate the disagreeable things to you. Now, in a, in a democratic society, you know, tolerance is this: it's when you have a disagreement and you can't come to a consensus by you know, nonviolent discourse, then you agree to disagree. Okay? You agree to disagree. You know, you're not like trying to force somebody you know, to take your opinion. You, okay, you know, can't get there without beating each other up. So you know you got you got what you think, I got what I think, and we just have to agree to disagree. That's what normally happens in a democratic society. Okay, the standard for everything is set by how much the majority in a society accepts opinions and behaviors, and how tolerant they're going to be of the minority. And that's where the standard is set. Now, you know, it works pretty well as long as the majority has some kind of an absolute truth. 
If society is based on an absolute truth or some kind of system of absolute truths, then a minority doesn't have to worry too much. Unless they don't really worry about that. They, 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 normally that's how things work. But what happens if they don't? What happens if absolute truth starts to dissolve? You look at our society lately. Like, it's all relative truth. What, what's right for me? What's right for you? And whether what's right for me and what's right for you, what, what's right for me, subjugates you, well, that's okay, because it's okay for me. This is, this is relative truth, and this is what we start seeing happening. And that becomes a problem when, it's, you know, when you have subjective truth. And thus, the minority is labeled as being intolerant. And suddenly we see society becoming intolerant of what they label as intolerant. Now all of a sudden the majority says, no, 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 you know, I mean, we're tolerant, but you're intolerant, so we're no longer tolerant of you. You're now intolerant of your intolerance. And that, you know, that actually has a name. This is called the paradox of tolerance. How do we make that look okay? How do we make that look justifiable in everyone's eyes, even those that haven't already directed fully? How do we do that? This is a really slippery slope. Everywhere you look today, tolerance is becoming a major, actually the major talking point meant to justify this paradox, even within the church. I mean, what, what is the thing? If I disagree with you on critical race theory, I'm a racist. You know? The person who is intolerant has now, is now being you know, accosted by people who are intolerant. Society and even some churches, tolerance has morphed into affirmation. No longer tolerant of what we perceive to be in the past. Form. We are now affirming those things. And that is part of the slippery slope that happened. How did you really believe this statistic? Right now, right now, just over 50% of the young people. I mean, this is the United States. Fifty percent of the young people think it should be a criminal, criminal offense to misgender someone. Okay, using the wrong pronoun as how they identify. Fifty percent of those young people who are coming up who are going to be in charge of this world in the very near future already think you should go to jail if you call somebody by the wrong pronoun. I love that. I'm going to help you guys out this morning because luckily I'm from Texas. All right, and, I, and so if you find yourself in a big group of people and you're like, I have no clue. It's like, all y'all are really confused. Okay. Believe it or not, that's a Texan program. Works every time. Uh, first and foremost, I have to set groundwork. I have to ask you guys three questions. Because what I'm going to teach this morning, you can't answer these three questions. It is going to be meaningful to you, and it's going to go nowhere. Okay, so I have to ask you these three questions first. Then we accept what God's Word uh, says about tolerance. And now, in this, if tolerance is not only unbiblical, but for the Christian, it's irrelevant. It means nothing. It's unbiblical, and it's irrelevant. I'll, I'll give you that in a minute. All right, so we just read 2 Timothy 3.16. So right there on the board, right? And we read it every single week. There's a big reason why we read it every single week and why this verse is really important to this church. Because it says all scripture is inspired by God. Right? We've read it, I don't know, a thousand times, at least, in front of this church. The Greek word for inspired here is, is a theonusis, which literally means God breathed. Okay? So question number one is this. Is like, do you believe that everything we read in this book okay, is literally breathed directly from God to God who did who recorded it exactly as God desired? What is God's word? What does God's word have to say about tolerance? What does it have to say to clear all this mess up? We know from Numbers 23, 19, we know from Titus 1, 2, we know from Hebrews 6, 18, and many other places. That God cannot lie. Okay? We know from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, Romans 8, 28, and Matthew 10, 29, 31, that God is utterly sovereign. 
in the real place. Okay? So question number two is this. Do you believe that the word you are reading, when you read God's word, is inerrant? So that you know how to handle every situation that you have to face. That it's sufficient for all of those things. Or, do you think like many that even though God is timeless and all-powerful, that his word has some type of a date stamp or an, expir or an expiration mark on it, and therefore it's no longer applicable to us today. God cannot lie. This is God's word. It's not. There's no foul. There's no, there's no error. There's no wrong teaching there. Everything is there. So that's the question. Do you believe that the word of God Contains no errors. Pretty good. See, a lot of times, like, you know, put y'all in the back of the car, you know, a whole bunch of helicopters. So you know, right? That's a good thing. That's a good thing this morning, all right? And for question number three, we're going to read just, we're going to read the next verse after 2 Timothy 3.16, which will give us some clarity. I will read this. Yeah, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness that... The man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay? So question number three, do you believe the word of God is sufficient? Because those are your choices. That's the true meaning of what God's word is, and that does that don't. So you must believe that God's word is God's word. It's inerrant, and it's sufficient. And I still see head problems, so we'll move on. Many people in today's progressive church relation to tolerance that will actually focus on a teaching, an example of what Jesus taught. I'm sure you've all heard that when Jesus was asked the greatest commandment, what do you feel like is the greatest commandment? That he answered in part, love your neighbor as yourself. Did he not say that? Yes, he did. The problem with that is, is that Jesus said something else. And he said something else first. So this is not a untruthful teaching. It's twisting because it's only partial. Progressive's argument is that that's what they focus on instead of the whole thing. But let's look at the whole thing. It says this. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all, and I looked up that word in the Greek, and you're never going to guess what it means. It means all. The law and the prophets. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. So yes, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind is the first and greatest. That's the first and greatest commandment. Jesus even tells us that all the law and the prophets' teachings are contained within those two principles. And what that basically means is that if you and I could actually do that, if we could actually do that, then everything else is moved. Okay, commandments, on the mouth, doesn't make any difference. If we could do those two things, nothing else would be irrelevant. It wouldn't matter. So we go back to it and say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. How do you show God that you love him? If you love me, keep my commandments. One, four, ten, fifteen, three. So you see, if we could love God with all our heart, soul, mind, all the other commandments, all that would fall into place just as they did for Jesus. He did all the things he did because he loved God. Tells what he did. James 2 10 tells us this. It says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of breaking the whole law. You can't do it. You can't do it. Jesus kept the entire law. And he is fulfilling the entire law of the prophets even today. He is still fulfilling those things. He was the perfect sacrifice for you and I because we can't help but pray for us. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. 
For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or one mark will pass from the law until it all be fulfilled. Not one mark will pass from the law until heaven and earth pass away and so forth. You know, I'm looking out the window here right now. And I can tell you, from you guys back is that it hasn't passed away. It's still out there. So the law is still applicable. It is still there. God's laws are still in place. Why is that important for our discussion this morning? Because even though Jesus taught us to love your neighbor as yourself, that doesn't supersede the law. It does not supersede the law. It only amplifies it. It only makes the law stronger if we believe and can love our neighbors as ourselves. Because we know that from John chapter 1 that Jesus is in fact the Word. He is the Word. Okay? And he tells us this. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. We have the promise that this still counts. It still counts. It still is God's word. It is still inerrant. And it still is sufficient for every single solitary thing that could come up in a good sense. It's not going to pass away. Why is that important? Because the world and the rest of the church will tell you that Jesus, this is important, never explicitly mentions homosexuality. He never explicitly mentions gender dysphoria. Which, if you don't know what that is, that's, I'm confused about what I am. I'm a boy, a girl, a dog, a cat, something in between. I mean, I just get confused. That is what gender dysphoria is. Okay? Uh, Same sex marriage. Ecumenism, pluralism, parallelism, and social justice. We'll talk about what those are if you don't know what it is. And since these terms are never explicitly mentioned by the Lord, he must be okay with all. That's what they say. He never mentioned them, so he's all right with them. So let's take a look, a deeper look in Scripture, of a few of these terms and see what Jesus implicitly says, first off, not explicitly, but implicitly says, about each other. Right? And uh, what we're going to do, we're going to start with homosexuality in the yeah, There are seven verses in God's Word that point directly at the practice of homosexuality. And the progressive church calls these the seven terror verses. Why? Okay, we'll look at it in a second. So this, this talk that we're going to be having about homosexuality we're going to be looking at will then move to cover gender dysphoria, any kind of uh, same-sex marriage. So let's take a look at what the seven verses are that all the terror verses in the Bible. Two of those verses, they cover homosexual rape. Okay, that's Genesis 19, 15 and Genesis 19, 23. Three of them refer to intercourse between men. So Leviticus 18, 21, and 22, Leviticus 20, 13, and Romans 1, 27. One refers to the intercourse between women. That's Romans 1, 26. One refers to prostitution and possibly pederasty. Now what that is, it's a weird word, but that means that older men forcing younger boys into having sex. I told you this was going to be a strange conversation, but this is, this is exactly what it is. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. And one is in general nature, just talking about any kind of that kind of sin, and that's in 1 Timothy 1 8 through 2. Alright. Progressive church today, we're going to jump through hoops to get you to believe that all of this stuff is either mistranslated, it's incorrectly translated, it didn't mean what it means today, or what we're trying to think of today in the time that it was completely different before it's thought in that particular line. Uh, by the way, homosexuality, the word never even came into existence until the 1800s. Glad that didn't happen. Okay, they're going to try to twist what you think about what these words mean. Or that Paul didn't have the authority, by the way, there are two thirds of the New Testament, but he did not have the authority to speak on the issues that he's speaking with when you see these ones that come from him, Romans, Corinthians, and Timothy. He doesn't have the authority to speak on those things. He's nowhere given the authority to speak 
on those kinds of sins. Now again, let me remind you, the Bible doesn't have an exam. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the Word. The Word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? So let's look, first off, at what Jesus implicitly says so that we can understand these things. He answered, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. What does this, what does this say? Well, first we have to understand, we go back to John 1, 3, and this is speaking of Jesus. By the way, that Jesus said that. That's red letter in the Bible. Jesus said that right here. John chapter 1, 3 tells us this. All things were created through him, and without him, nothing was created that was created. Male and female, nothing was created without him that was created. But basically, Jesus is saying here, you know, when I made them, Okay? I created only two genders, caused and created to come together as one flesh, physically and sexually, in union for life. This is my plan for mankind. Don't mess with it. Do not put this under. Don't mess it up. There's no confusion here. Right? Yeah, he doesn't say that there's something wrong with homosexuality, but he tells us how it's supposed to be. It's an implicit reference to how he made it. That's what it's supposed to be. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Progressive churches say, well, you know, this is the 21st century, and, and there'll be a bunch of other plans. Jesus is saying, as I understand in the future, that will be okay, it will be no. That's not what he's saying. This is forever. <laughs> but God is joined together forever. Don't mess with it. Hebrews uh, 13, 4 tells us this. Marriage is to be honored among everyone in the bed undefiled. But God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. So this verse means marriage is precious above all things. God's plan for humanity. And it's to be treated that way. It's to be honored as his plan. Any sexual contact outside of the biblical institution of marriage is immoral for adulterers. And he said, what comes out of me is what defiles me. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. Adultery, fornication, murder, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile me. Again, red letters. Look at your Bible. Those are red. If you have them in the tradition. All right. So... Jesus tells us clearly, there's a fornication of adultery that's a man. What does that mean? Defilement is a state of being impure, dishonored, or desecrated. That's what defilement is. It's, it's desecration. You know, when, when, when people talk about the Old Testament, talk about the Leviticus chapter 18, what it says about homosexuality, and it says, you know, it's a detestable thing. It's an abomination. To defile something is an act of great disrespect. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Jesus is upholding here the final judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's upholding it. He's saying, yes, he's not saying, oh, Sodom and Gomorrah is not going to be judged. He says that the towns that decided not to listen to the gospel message when the apostles came in there. First off, you will shake off, you just leave, shake off your sandals, shake the dust from that place where your sandals, and I'm telling you, it will be worse for them than it will be for Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah are still under judgment. They're still under judgment. Now, the rest of the church is going to try to get you to think that the judgment was due to inhospitality. All right, and, and, and you know what? They have a verse. Ezekiel 16, 49. Clearly says that one of the reasons this Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed 
because they were inhospitable. They were not welcoming. But you know what? That's why you gotta know the whole Bible. Because that never quote this next verse. You go to Jude 1 7. Jude 1 7 clearly tells you the destruction of Sodom is because of homosexuality. There's two verses here. For argument, okay, these change on, on this subject, talking about things that Jesus said, you know, not explicitly, in, implicitly. These are explicit. Okay? And, and nobody will ever quote these. No progressive Christian who is affirming homosexuality or gender dysphoria or any of those things will ever quote these. But I'm going to show you that this is an explicit condemnation by Jesus Christ. It's the argument against Paul's. But I have a few things against you. You have there those who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stomach block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So you have also those who hold to the teachings of the New Nations. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will war against them with the sword of my command. But this you have. This, but this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Does anybody else here not think that Jesus has or think that Jesus has a problem with the Nicolaitans teaching? He hates them. He hates it. It's a bad thing to him. I mean, I don't know how you can get more explicit than that than to say, I hate it, and you're doing it. You're, you've got people there that are listening to this garbage. Okay, so what is the teaching? It's concept that they taught is that grace covers everything. Okay? Grace covers everything. You can go and you can go out and do whatever you want to do because you are covered by grace once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you want to, if you want to stay in your sin and just go ahead and keep on doing all that, it's fine. You cover by grace. And I think it's important to note okay, that pagan practices of the day, that this would have been saying it was okay for, were all kinds of sexual sin. This, is that, you know, this would cover homosexuality, this would cover gender dysphoria, this would cover same sex marriage. All of those things would have been okay for the next lady. They just said, yep, that's perfectly allowed because we're under grace. The church has, again, fallen into the trap of the Nicolaitans. So Jesus implicitly reveals where he stands on these issues by affirming his creation story. He did that. Affirming his stand on defilement, red letters. Affirming the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. And affirming explicitly. His stance on the Nicolaitans misunderstanding of grace. Jesus is love. Jesus is love. But he never affirmed sinful behavior. He never tolerated sinful behavior. We kind of two other clarifications. When anyone says Jesus didn't explicitly forbid these types of sins, please also also share these two verses. There are also many other things which Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. Listen, in the Bible, Jesus never, ever explicitly comes against child rape or abortion or slavery. But we know right here today that that's immoral. Those things were immoral, but he never, he never explicitly said anything about those things. He never came out and condemned any of those things. So are we supposed to just believe that because he didn't say anything about it? He says there were lots of things that he didn't, weren't included in the Bible for us to say. So do we think that he didn't teach it? Do we think that he probably, nowhere ever in that time that he was with the disciples that he would have never mentioned any of those things to the disciples? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
The words of the apostles, remember, given to the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit written down for us to have this word. Those, by extension, even if you don't already believe that, that, this, that this book, this is Christ, right here, if you don't, even if you don't believe that already, these are the teachings of Christ. The apostles, Paul, and all those versions about homosexuality, all of those things are the teachings of Christ. There's two reasons. Because he is the word, and because he told them, teach them all the things that I commanded you. Okay? So we have verses about sexual sin in a few locations in the Bible. I mean, Matthew wrote about it, Mark wrote about it, Luke wrote about it, although he wasn't an apostle. John wrote about it, Peter wrote about it, James wrote about it, Jude wrote about it, and of course Paul wrote all over the place about it, right? Guess how many people that wrote the New Testament didn't write about it? Zero. Every New Testament author writes about it. And if you take it in that context right there, it's horrible, it's wrong. So what are some of the other doctrines? What are some of the other doctrines that we can look at where people are having call for tolerance? I mentioned them in the beginning. We have ecumenism, parallelism, and pluralism. But without going into a big, long explanation about all of what those things are, I'm just going to throw them in a bucket together, and I'm going to call it other ways to God, except Jesus Christ. Okay? Other ways to get there, and also to eternity. When, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Come, O Lord. Now listen, the word for love here is phileo. It's in the Greek, this is brotherly love, or better, it's like friendship. You know, you look at the, the city of Philadelphia. We have one here, we have one in the United States. It means the city of brotherly love. John 15, 14 and 15 tells us this. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. I no longer call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master does, but I have called you friends for everything that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. So we see an almost identical situation here that we saw for the greatest commandments. Love God, obey the commandments. Be a friend of Jesus, obey his commandments. To be Jesus' friends, we have to obey his words, which clearly tell us, Amen. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. It's one way. There's no other way. There's no parallelism. There's no, there's no you know, pluralism. Ecumenism, that it's like, okay, yeah, we just accept whatever you do because we all kind of are going in the same direction. So if they're preaching a different Jesus, it's okay. You know, we're all, it's all Jesus. No, it's wrong. It is tolerance of the wrong things. Anyone who claims that Jesus never explicitly says that there's only one way to God and therefore heaven needs an eye doctor. So if you're a true believer this morning, you'll understand what Jesus told his disciples in verse 4. Right before this, he says, you know where I'm going, and you know the way. It's another research thing that's going to freak you out. Research clearly shows that 70% of professing Christians today, they don't know the way. They don't know how to get there. Because they believe that there are many paths to God. They believe that many religions lead to the exact same place. They believe that if you're worshiping Jesus, no matter what Jesus it is, it doesn't have to be Jesus of the Bible that you're going to the same place. 70%. That's frightening. That's frightening. This is going against the majority, and believing the truth of the word is not an easy thing to do. It's not easy. But tolerance is a candy coating used by the enemy to cover up sin. That's what it is. 
But in the beginning of this sermon, I say that the tolerance is not only unbiblical, but for the Christian, it's irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. We have seen the unbiblical definition unfold. Why the things that they're being tolerant of are not contained in God's Word. The things that they are being tolerant of are taught against explicitly and implicitly by Jesus Christ. Take your pick. It all works out if you know what God's Word contains. To find out what we mean or what I mean by it's irrelevant to us, we need to go back and we need to revisit that second command. As the second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right? I don't know about you guys, but I like being loved. Okay? And so, the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to love the neighbor as myself. And I love everybody in God. That's what being a Christian is about. We are supposed to love everybody in our sphere of influence enough to not be tolerant. To be exactly the opposite of that. We follow Jesus, who said this, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It's not tolerance. It's not tolerance. That's love. That's love. He didn't say, Yeah, I don't condemn you. Knock yourself out. Do whatever you want to do. That is not the message of Jesus Christ. As you knew somebody had a dead deep nut power. And he ran into him down at China Mart. And he saw him bend over and pick up a package of peanut and eggs. Alright? And they, they walked over to him and they're like, man, these look really good. Now, do you say, and you affirm, yes, those look really good? And, and, and you, should, you should have some of those. No? Is that what we would do? Or do, you, or do you tell them, look, that's a bad decision because underneath that candy coated surplus, death is lurking. Remember, command to love your neighbor as yourself. You should honor that command. We do this for everybody we know. Not tolerate it. Not tolerate it. Talk about it. Tell them about it. Keep in mind. God, the Father, now he is intolerant of sin. He is absolutely tolerant, not tolerant of sin. God is merciful. God is loving. And God is patient, but he isn't tolerant. But just consider Cain, Sodom, Pharaoh, Korah, Onan, Ibn Hu and Medad, Hakan, Nabal, Saul, Uzzah, Hakan and Phineas, Jeroboam, the prophets of Baal, Ahab, Herod Antipas, and Ananias and Sapphira. Does any of that look tolerant? Look at Paul Frey, the rise of tolerance. We've been looking at zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. Instead, loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and loving your neighbors as yourself. Right, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the day. Thank you for your word, Lord God. It clears up so much. It just makes the path obvious for us, Lord, that we care to love. Lord, God, we thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for each person that's here this morning. And 